Our subject this morning is revival in the local church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, we have, it seems to me, a glorious vision, a divine vision for the church. And I take it that it's not just for the church universal, but it's for the local church. The Bible said that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You might stop and think, if he doesn't love your local church, what church is he talking about? You might say Christ loves the assembly. Christ loves the local church. And he gave himself for it. And look at this marvelous vision that he has here. His desire. He says that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that the, she should be holy and blameless. You think of your local church in this way, to what extent that it corresponds to this vision, or it is moving toward this vision, or what can be done, and we hope we'll look at this today, to move our church, the local church, to the realization of what is expressed here. In a well-known book some years ago on the subject of the church, the writer Michael Griffith entitled his book, Cinderella in Rags, the Cinderella being the local church with all of its potential and its beauty, nevertheless presenting an outward appearance of being in a ragged state. We have a, a real problem and challenge with respect to local churches today all over the world. And that is, as far as society is concerned, our lack of impact upon society. And we are told in scripture that we are lampstands. We are to be lighthouses. It says a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It said to the individual, and I'm sure to the church, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Unfortunately, society does not see the local church in this way. The main publicity the local church gets today is things like scandal, corruption, excessive interest in money, begging, deadness, irrelevance, and a description of our world as the post-Christian age. It doesn't look like that we're moving toward the realization of the divine vision. And yet we, see, we must believe that we have the same enablements to move toward that vision as the early church did in the first century. It has been estimated that one half of the civilized world in that first century turned from paganism to becoming Christians. So great was the impact of the believers of the local churches in that day without all of the supposed advantages that we have today, printing, publishing, radio, big facilities and everything else. They didn't have any of that. In fact, they had intensive persecution, opposition, misunderstanding, even accusation that they were atheist. And yet, in a relatively short time, they overturned the prevailing religion of the Romans, the Greeks, and others. They were the destroyers of false gods, which remain destroyed to this day. It is said that perhaps half of the world had become Christians. Now today we have one-third of the world that is professedly Christian, but not even the wildest optimist imagines that all these people are truly believers. In fact, there may not be, conservatively speaking, more than 300,000 or 300 million evangelical believers in all the world. Still, it is more believers, that is, cumulatively, at one time on earth than we've ever had. The greatest number of Christians but strangely, the least impact on society around us. The question is not just the problem, but what is the solution? And I, I don't want to discredit sincere people who try in their own way to remedy this, and their big quest, as they seem to, to think it is, is to accumulate more bodies inside of the church. Now, it's not that we're, not disin we're disinterested in numbers, because the early church did grow in numbers. The danger to this movement is it becomes so obsessed with numbers and of paying whatever price that it takes to get in numbers 
that they lose sight of, of another purpose, and that is the spiritual condition of the people that are coming or the transforming ability of the church. It's very interesting, a famous management consultant who I don't even know is a Christian, but when I was a businessman was a widely used consultant, perhaps the most famous management consultant in the world called Peter Drucker, was invited recently to a meeting of denominations in America to address them. Uh, and nobody is in a sicker condition today than the mainline Protestant denominations. This is in the current issue of Christianity Today. Peter Drucker said this in his counsel to the churches. Remember, I don't even think that Peter Drucker is a believer, but he's a good observer. And here's what he said. What is needed today is, one, we must address the spiritual needs of the people and seek to help them. Underline spiritual needs, not psychological needs, spiritual needs. I saw a television ad just the other day for one of our largest churches around here, and the thing they advertised, as I viewed the ad, they had uh, coffee times around the table and conversation, they had sports events, uh, they had somebody on there saying how much they had found that uh, Christ had helped them to understand themselves. In all of this, this became the great appeal. He said, the people seek spiritual help. Secondly, he said, expect a lot from churchgoers. People tend to rise to expectation. Today, there's a tendency to lower expectations on the ground that somehow or another, if you have high standards, that you will discourage people from coming or in the popular buzzword of a few years ago, that you're going to lay a guilt trip on them. We want to soft soap the message, dilute it, adulterate it, do anything we can to take out anything that would be unattractive to the world. And indeed, when they come in, there's very little expectation they're going to do anything. They're not challenged, they're not trained. He said, but when you expect a lot from the people that you come, that is on the basis of the Word of God, not just the desires of the leaders, he said, people tend to rise to those expectations. Third, he said, never apologize for your church distinctions. If you don't have distinctions, why do you exist? Don't apologize. Don't back off from them. Stand up for what you believe. And fourth, he said, expect lives to be transformed. Christian faith is a transformational religion. Transformational. People who come to the local church, in a sense, need to be transformed. And what we do in that church, whether by messages or whatever it else, needs to be aimed at the transformation of the lives of the people. But when those people remain more or less in the same condition, when the rates of marital breakup or marital discord or juvenile delinquency or commitment to Christ are no redder. In fact, they tend to go downhill. You know that you have a failure of the spiritual ministry of the church. I don't care how many bodies you get into it. The real issue is that when people come to your church, their lives are being changed. That's the acid test because ours is a transformational faith. But the direction so often has not been to that. The people interested in church growth have coined such phrases as market oriented, consumer driven, or in the great phrase in the computer world, user friendly. The church, said one author in a leading Christian discipleship magazine of all things, says the church is for unbelievers. Interestingly enough, he didn't cite a single verse of scripture for the obvious reason there is no verse that the church is for unbelievers. In fact, most of the evangelistic work of the church was not carried on in the church itself at all. It was carried on in the individual and witness and lives of the Christian outside of the church. However, when people come to church, if they are challenged by messages which are directed to building up and challenging the lives of the believers, that in turn can be the very means of securing opportunities to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. A <sighs> uh, uh, church critic Incidentally, who is a liberal, not a conservative, wrote a book a few years ago, and he referred to the tendency in the evangelical church today 
His name was Quibido. The title of his church was The Worldly Evangelicals. In a sense, he was mocking us. We are attempting to be more like the world to attract the world. We want the church to become user-friendly. You know, J.I. Packer wrote a book called Hot Tub Religion. He had an experience one time and his students encouraged him to go to a place where he had hot tubs where he had never experienced. And he said he was sitting there under the jacuzzi or whatever it was and he was saying, now this is a wonderful idea for church growth according to these people's ideas. You tear out all the pews and put in hot tubs out there and then the people can kind of luxuriate around under there as it plays on their backs and be ministered to. This particular cartoon in Leadership Magazine shows people out there, for example, with popcorn on the table and in their loafers and so forth, and even with a switch-off button if there's something they don't like to hear. <laughs> well, they say, what difference does it make if you get the people in? You have competition as to who has the best chair, church. One emphasizes that we love you and we care for you in an unloved world. It's far more important that you show love than that you try to market love as a marketing device. But the other church next door says, yeah, but we got better music. You're competing on the wrong basis. The result is that you have a whole bunch of people that are not being transformed into disciples, the message of Jesus, but they have become what is called pew potatoes. The old thing is couch potatoes, a fellow that just sits on the by the tube, as you know, as the majority of our Christians do, flipping it on and off. And then you have the electronic church. People only attend church and listen to church by television or something else. But they don't really change this mode at home when they go to church. The man says to them, I don't suppose we have any volunteers for vac vacation Bible school. The ob I can tell him right now they wouldn't. They won't have any volunteers. You don't get people to work in church by calling for volunteers. You get people to become workers in the church by building them up spiritually. So they want to exercise their gift and they want to serve Jesus Christ out of a love for him. You're not just filling slots. Anybody can fill slots. We're not in the slot filling business or shouldn't be at least. What does the church need? All around this room this morning, we've put some various posters, and we've also put it in manual, and I'll, I'll encourage you to go look at those things, what the church needs and what it doesn't need. But the number one thing, which is certainly not mentioned by the modern church government, the number one thing the local church needs in its people is the power of the Holy Spirit of God, for which there is no substitute. We're not in need of better programs, better gimmicks, efforts to attract the unchurched by appeals to their fleshly interests. What the Bible calls that the last days, people he will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's not the teachers that have the itching ears, it's the people. And those that are inclined to scratch the itching ears of those people to give the people, as they say, what the public wants will not serve the interest of the Holy Spirit who as God himself so often will tell you perhaps the things that you don't want to hear. Is the church for the unsaved? I don't think so. A church is a gathering of the people of God to be nurtured, to be built up, to be discipled, and to serve God, and thereby by holy lives to attract the unsaved to the message of Jesus Christ. God is working through people like that, as we'll see this in our next session on the subject of witnessing. We need the power of God's Spirit, and we need that to operate in yielded vessels and people who are willing to sacrifice their own comfort, their own interest, the interest of this world, for the interest of Jesus Christ, of his church, and of God's kingdom. Recently, a teenager who had left our church, I think he thought, we were a little too demanding. Sometimes they think of us as having too high standards, and he visited a couple of other churches. Not long afterwards, he came back, and we asked, somebody asked him why he came back, and he said, well, I visited the other churches, and he said, and I quote, it was too theatrical. Here's a teenager that could see that. It's amazing that more mature people cannot see that. 
You see, it's been said that long ago in the 1930s, it was said that vaudeville died. Later, the saying was revived. Vaudeville never died. Show business never died. It just moved into the church. We sell tickets for concerts, you see. And many times, the churches are involved basically in show business. And as the old saying goes, there's no business like show business. Gary Trudeau in his cartoons, Doonesbury, who's a great social critic and by no means a Christian, has mocked the churches for doing this, ridiculed them. And I've put copies of those cartoons in your manual to see the extent to which these unwise efforts have brought us into the rebuke of the world. It has become like Lot in the city of Sodom that when he spoke to his own sons, they thought he was joking. He had lost his testimony. You say, but do we not have a problem of deadness and a lack of growth? My answer is absolutely yes, for a number of years. I've preached message on the subject of the need for revival in the church. I believe that. I believe we have a terrible problem in terms of deadness and lack of commitment or concentration in these things. But I do not believe that the answer to these things in the church consists of new techniques or programs, consumerism, market orientation, churches couch to give the unbeliever what the other believer thinks he needs and wants. If the Lord Jesus came to your church today and disguised and saw it, he sat among you and he was the silent listener to everything that went on in your church service and he was the observer, what would the Lord of the church think if he came to your church? What would be his prescription for whatever is wrong with it? I don't think it would be for any of the contemporary ideas. I think he would get back to the very things that are in God's word itself, and that is the power of God in a yielded, in a yielded vessel. Fasting, prayer, brokenness, confession, commitment. These are the things that are emphasized in the word of God. In fact, he would direct us to the very words of scripture. And that is the need for revival. There are many verses in God's word on the subject, but the, one of the greatest and longest of the Psalms emphasizes the need for revival many, many times. In point of fact, we can see that the psalmist was a very spiritual man, one of the most spiritual. Nobody but a spiritual man could have been used by God to write this. And yet he is deeply conscious, even in his level, of his need for revival. In Psalm 119, in verse 37, we read, the psalmist said, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in thy ways. In verse 40, it says, behold, I long for thy precepts. Revive me through thy righteousness. And verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction that thy word has revived me. The continual emphasis of these and many other words simply is revival is keenly linked to the powerful preaching and the reception to the preaching of the Word of God in revivaling. In fact, we can, we can frankly say that John the Baptist may have been the first of the revivalist in the modern day. And in the 19th century, the great preachers that went around the world, whether it was Moody or someone else later, they were essentially thought of as revivalists, and those meetings were called revivals. They preached that kind of message. And the impact of the message was so great that many times people were left weeping in the streets, that people were going back to return stolen property. In Scotland, on one occasion in a city in a great shipyard, the people, the workers there, so many of them were converted and returned stolen property that they filled all the warehouses with it and the company said, don't bring back any more. It was responsible, really, for breaking the power of alcohol over the people. There was a tremendous reduction in the crime rate, the alcohol rate, and everything else. It happened to do through the reviving, the true reviving work of the Holy Spirit working through the powerful preaching of God's Word. We have that kind of problem, and there are many other verses on this subject in God's Word. But revival is not something that, so to speak, just falls spontaneously on a large group of people for no given reason. 
You often say that if the will of God was followed, every person in the world would be a Christian, if it was entirely up to him. And if it was only the will of God that was at, 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 to be counted, every Christian would be spiritual. But every Christian is not spiritual. You see, the work of God's Spirit depends upon responsive vessels. That's the key. You say, well, we would really like God to work in our church, and I really want God to work in my life. The question is, how bad do you want God to work in your life? How important is that to you? A man came to a preacher one time, and he said, I would give anything I have to have the knowledge of the Word of God that you have. And his answer said was, and that's exactly what it cost me. Paul himself said in behalf of the church and of Christ, he said, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Our problem today that we do not want to lose least of creature comforts for the one who gave himself for us. Revival, in a sense, has to take place one at a time. The great ministry of the Lord Jesus was to individuals. The outstanding events of his life in the gospel had to do with his one-to-one -one contact with individual. Each believer, or unbeliever for that matter, has to respond to the individual work of the Holy Spirit in his life. And of course, we need to know the obstacles uh, to his work if we are to experience genuine revival. In Revelation 3, 15 and 16, one of the most damning verses in Scripture is the Lord Jesus moves among the churches and supplies his critique. I've often thought, if Jesus came at the end of time and he says he's going to judge churches as well as individuals, and he was giving an evaluation of your local church, what would the Lord Jesus say about your church in his evaluation? Well, he would certainly begin, as he often did in these seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, by saying what he said to them, I know your works. I know all about your church. I know everything that's going on in the church. I know the condition of every member, and I know the condition of the church. I know all about it. If there's anything to commend, as we see, he would commend it. But then he would add these solemn words. He said, but I have somewhat against thee. I mean, if you look at the criticisms of Jesus of the local church, it's not because they don't have up-to-date pro uh, programs and better off-street parking. He's talking about their spiritual condition as individuals. And this, in his famous message to the church of Laodicea, is well known. He said, you are lukewarm. That's your problem. You're lukewarm. This morning we served coffee to guests. I want to tell you that I didn't serve them lukewarm coffee. But nobody likes lukewarm coffee. If I had, I wonder what would have happened if they had done what Jesus had, said, did here. And that he would have said, <laughs> and spit it out all over my wife's nice carpet. He said, oh, it's unthinkable. But that's what the Lord Jesus says to this. You spit something out of your mouth, it's because it nauseates you. It's sickening. And what the Lord says to this church, he says, you make me sick at my stomach. You make me sick at my stomach. This is a church of professing Christians. He says, you make me sick at my stomach looking at your church. He said the same thing about it. He said, you don't seem to be aware of it. You think you're in great shape. They'd looked at it through the eyes, the condition through the eyes of the Spirit. They'd know it wasn't in great shape, and they weren't in great shape. I always marvel that people think they're in great shape spiritually. Frankly, I don't really, I'm not overly pleased with me being in great spiritual shape every day. I find I have a lot of character defects and needs to grow to be in the image of Christ. Frankly, I'm not at all complacent about my spiritual life. I want to tell you this, I'm not even complacent about the conditions in our church. 
I think we've got a lot of things to do, a lot of room to grow. Many of our people are here. I don't think we've arrived. I think we've got a long way to go to meet the standards of Christ. I'm not complaining. I don't understand how people can be so complacent. It's kind of like going into a house and somebody's a poor housekeeper and the whole place is a scene of squalor, but it doesn't seem to bother them. They've got dishes stacked up in the sink for the last two or three days, dirt all over the floor, junk from one end to the other. It doesn't seem to bother them. For a neat housekeeper, and I think some of you are here this morning, that's incomprehensible. What's the matter with you? I remember being in a, in a church one time in Canada, I don't pick on Canadians, it just I happen to remember this particular one is, I went in there, I, I, I was staying in a home and they were well, well they, had, they, had, they had carpets this thick. I mean, it was a luxury home. And we went to the building where the, the chapel was and uh, it was unpainted. The sign with the church's name on it, it was down like this. The worst thing is we went in there and the cop carpets were so threadbare that they had threads sticking up. You could have fallen and been sued. This guy at home, he had carpets thick, modern carpets. They had nothing but a shambles in there. But it didn't seem to bother them. Now, today we understand the value of facilities. People are much more apt to be concerned about their facilities, how neat it is, than the spiritual condition of the church. The great problem is not rags and tatters on the rugs or an unpainted exterior. It is the, low, the woeful condition of those who are in the church, which attribute, is attributed to their lack of impact on society. You're lukewarm. That's your problem. And the Lord Jesus says, it makes me sick. You're not cold. You're not hot. He said, I wish you were one or the other. At least you'd realize it. But you think you're kind of in between, so it doesn't bother you. A man used this illustration one time. He drew a circle. He says, let this represent being inside this circle means that you are a true child of God. And then put a dot in the middle of that circle. And let that dot be the absolute center of the will and purposes of God for your life. Now take a pen and you make a mark where you think you are in your own personal life. And to this you could add the church, which is after all the conglomeration of the individuals in it. Where would you put yourself in that circle? Now the surprising thing is that even if they aren't Christians, they never put themselves outside of the circle. They're always inside the circle. Everybody today thinks they're Christians. And the law is to the highest because we so cheapened and adulterated the message of the gospel that they think that anybody that simply agrees that Jesus is a nice fella or died on the cross in some general way for our sins or that God exists, that they're Christians. They believe that. But let us say you, you believe that in truth about yourself. You say, where did you put to Mark? Here's the amazing thing. Not only nobody put their mark outside the circle, not a single solitary person put their mark right at center dot. Where do they put it? Usually halfway between the dot and the outer circle. I said, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. And he says, and you make me sick. I had a woman say, I noticed the other day in a report, she said, you know, your church has too high standards, and your church doesn't grade on the curve like most churches. <laughs> ah, I thought that's a marvelous expression, grade on the curve. Well, if you graded on the curve, on the circle illustration, the in-between or lukewarm state would be represented as 100 entirely satisfactory with God. Praise God, I'm not outside. But in advance, if you're outside, you're better off because you know your spiritual condition. If we really knew our condition, if we really knew our condition, then we would move to grieve over it, as we'll see this later. 
I believe the Lord himself grieves over the spiritual condition of his people. I think we, and the scripture says, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We have such a low, low estimate and vision of the purpose of our lives. Why God ever saved you? Why God ever opened your eyes to the knowledge of the truth? You think the only reason he saved you is to keep your soul out of hell and to take you to heaven. And yet it's never said in the choosing and election of God that the purpose was simply to take you to heaven and keep you out of hell. The choosing and election of God is always to a divine purpose involves your character in your life. He has chosen you. He has chosen you to be holy and blamable and unreprovable. He's chosen you to be molded in the image of Christ. He's chosen you to grow and to be prepared for the glory. That's the very purpose of your choosing, your calling of God. Be a holy people. And it grieves the Holy Spirit that we don't see that. We've got our ticket to heaven, and that's all that matters. The Lord says continually, the basis of revival, you say, where do you start for revival? Where do you start to get right with God? Many times people ask me this question, and I say very simply, we need to be called to genuine repentance, a recognition of our sinfulness before God and the need to turn from our negligent ways, our apathy, our carnality, to turn to Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. A preacher who's a friend of mine preaches all over the world, Wayland Moore. He said, you know, whenever you get in front of churches, church congregations, he said, you look out. He said, you look out on a sea of carnality and mediocrity. You never see this on these pep talks about what's happening in the church. That's what a spiritual man says, and I'm, I'm afraid that's what the Lord Jesus sees, a sea of carnality and mediocrity. That grieves him. I remember in his post-resurrection ministry, the Lord Jesus said, in one of his few exclamations of impatience, he said, how long shall I put up with you? Repent. One time I was uh, visiting in the state maximum security prison and I was walking around one of the inmates who had been at that time given freedom. You don't have that kind of freedom over there now. And he was walking down the cells and one of them cried out to him. He said, do you have a word from God for me? And he turned around and said, I do. He said, it's repent. And with no further explanation, he walked on. I was a stunner. You know, I was stunned. Repent. Repent. A change of mind, but it's only sincere if it's accompanied by a change of action. True repentance, like true faith, is never a mental assent or agreement. It's not saying that's a very nice thing this morning. We enjoyed all that. That's very wonderful. We agree with that but that you don't seriously assess your life and determine there's going to be changes in you. And we hope this morning there are going to be changes in your church to make it pleasing to God. You repent. We have a lack of repentance. And I think one of the reasons is we have a certain amount of pride and a pride that doesn't want to admit our true condition. You want to be revived, Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. The thing we need to realize is that we serve a holy God. The angels of God, it says, rest not day and night, chanting before the throne of God, holy, 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 and a grossly unholy, unholy church has failed to realize that about the character of God. He's a holy God. His spirit is a holy spirit. His Bible is a holy Bible. You don't, you don't walk with God. You don't have fellowship with God when you have an unholy and defiled life. Don't kid yourself. You want to have fellowship with me? When I dwell in a high and holy place, not in a low and mediocre place, 
He said, Here, here's who I dwell with. Here's who I walk with, a contrite and lowly of spirit. Contrite means I'm sorry about my spiritual condition, and I want to see it changed. We don't use that word much. Catholic Church uses it, acts of contrition. It's another word for repentance. Contrite, lowly of spirit, not self-satisfied, not smug, not I'm better than most. I do this, I do that. You know, like the Pharisees who thank God that he wasn't like others. You don't compare yourself with others. The comparison basis is Jesus. It's God, not other people. Lowly of spirit. In order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the spirit of the contrite. And he says elsewhere, he says, to this man will I look. He said, I'll listen to that man. We often see that in the kings. He'd say, do you see, he'd say to the prophet, how this man humbles himself before me? You see that? Now notice that. Notice that. God always honors a truly humble, contrite person. The man said, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified. Man would come, acknowledging his sins. Or a woman would come. He'd say, go and sin no more. God looks at that person. You get on what is called your spiritual high horse, and you're never going to get any way with God. When I'm at my lowest, I don't get on my knees before God. I get on my face toward God, and I dig my nose into the carpet. I know how God feels about it. Psalm 85, one of the great verses on revival. And one of the things is, points to the fact that the person who needs revival has lost his joy in the Lord. He says in verse 4 of Psalm 85, Restore, O God, of our salvation and cause thine indignation toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? You think that God could be angry with Christians? I see in the Bible at times it was. I don't want him angry with me. I don't even want him to be upset with me. Will thou not thyself Revive us again. That's the only one that can give you revival. Are you going to go on and you're going to be, as we say, dead as a doornail? Thus God revives you and he'll revive you on his terms, not on yours. For what purpose that thy people may rejoice in thee? People say they want to be happy. Well, I'm sure God doesn't want to be miserable. But the word happy comes from the word happenstance. The root is basically by chance. And it wholly relates to circumstances. When your circumstances are bad, you can't be happy. But when your circumstances are good, you're very happy. That's why you're running around badly. I took my grandchildren to Marine World and everything, gave them a ride on an elephant as they rode by. What happy children! Ah, yeah, but it didn't last. 30 minutes later, they were arguing. I took them to Disneyland. It's almost impossible to find unhappy people down there. Lasted for a while. Then they weren't happy. Happiness in that sense always depends on circumstances. But genuine joy, genuine joy, Depends on satisfaction in God. You have your fulfillment in Him. Two days ago, I saw a woman like that. I visited her in a state penitentiary. She's there for shooting her abusive husband who molested her children sexually. <coughs> Serving a life sentence. He's God's number one missionary there. 
I, I went there to minister to and to encourage Linda. I came away and Linda encouraged me. Boy, that woman was radiant. I said, how's the food? She says, we call it dog food. <laughs> I don't like to come out when I come out to see and be strip searched. I don't like to live in a room that has meant built for four people and has 10 in it and they're gonna build it up to 12 soon. I don't like to be in a place where people treat you like dogs, but she says this, I have joy in Jesus and I can tell it. I mean, she has tremendous impact. When she was at a local jail being held, I got a steady stream of re referrals to women. In fact, as I recall, every single one of them was a murderess. One of them killed her own mother with an ice pick. This woman, these, these women said to me, we wouldn't even talk to you if it wasn't for the testimony of Linda. I tell you, when you can testify for Christ under circumstances like that, and you can radiate in a, in a hole like she's in, I want to tell you, you got the joy of the Lord. It has nothing to do with circumstances. See, when you're revived, you learn how to find satisfaction in the Lord. How else could you, as I've often seen people in terminal illness, lying on a deathbed in tremendous pain, and they had the joy of the Lord. I'm ready. One of them said to me, brother, I got to settle peace. You try, you try, if you're not in relationship to Christ, to have joy when you're dying painfully of a terminal illness. Now, be happy. You can't do it. Only the joy of the Lord will do that. And you never have the joy of the Lord till you understand the joy has to be in Jesus. You have a lack of fruit. No fruit. Jesus said, I have ordained you that you'd bring forth fruit. You don't have fruit. You don't have fruit in character. You don't have fruit in your ministry. There's neglect of your devotional life. You don't have a regular, solid devotional life. You're not feeding yourself from the Word. You're not applying it. You're not being transformed. You're not an intercessor. You got time for everything else, but you had time for God. You have a lack of concern. People are on around you without, with Christ. 90% of Christians never win a single person to Christ. In fact, most of them never even witness. And you have a lack of spiritual power. Deuteronomy says this, that God looked on his people and he was sorry. He said, because they lost their power. The Lord said, I feel sorry for you because you're in a condition you don't have to be in. May God help us to experience the reviving work of the Holy Spirit in us is yielded vessels when we acknowledge these are problems in our lives in whole or in part. I God help us to take heed to this. As Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Lord Jesus, may it be so for your name's sake. Amen.